Thanks for joining our presentation. Um, my name is Jackie Cook and I'm going to be introducing you to um, this presentation today. It's called Translating a Sleeping Language for a Feature Film. Um, so we'll have a short video from the director, Roderick McKay, which shows a bit of the on-set activity. Um, you'll hear from Gertrude Simpson, who is our main language consultant. Um, we hear from James Bednall, who is a linguist who's worked a lot with Buddy Maya language. And then finally, you'll hear from Lucy Satoris, our language coordinator here at Itawonga. So I'm sitting here at the Itawonga Language Centre at the moment. We're located in Geraldton, which is highlighted there in red. Um, that's roughly 420k north of Perth, uh, Western Australia. So we service the Midwest and Gascoigne regions of WA, and we officially work with seven different language groups. Um, so what kind of work do we do? Our focus is on language maintenance, language vitalization, and language reclamation. So this involves archives, um, documenting speakers, creating resources, supporting teachers, and language promotion. Um, so this is just a little map of Buddy Maya country. So you can see Geraldton here on the edge, um, and you can see the other languages around Buddy Maya there. And Buddy Maya is there, based around like Herkaloka Station, Mount Magnet, down to Del Wallenu, Payne's Find, etc. Um, so I'll give you a brief introduction to the furnace. Um, it's these are the funders down the bottom. Um, Brief synopsis, 1897, Western Australia. To escape the goldfields and return home, a young Afghan cameleer partners with a rugged bushman on the run with two 400 Oz crown marked gold bars. Together, the unlikely pair must outwit, outwit a zealous sergeant and his troopers in a race to reach a secret furnace, the one place where they can safely reset the gold bars to remove the mark of the crown. Um, this was inspired um, by history as you can see in these photos here of the interactions between cameleers and aboriginal people and their the cameleers role in australia's history um, uh, all the filming was done around mount magnet which is on buddy Maya country you can see that in the blue pin to um in the inland area there and also in calvary which is in nanda country um, and now you'll hear from Frederick. there are a significant number of scenes in this film that are actually spoken entirely in the Yamaji Budimaya language. The last true speaker of the Budimaya language passed away um, almost exactly a year before production commenced on the film. And uh, this did make it quite difficult because there's no longer one sort of individual that is this pillar of, of knowledge. So it becomes a community consultation where you're kind of pulling together shared knowledge uh, to get that translation correct. This is a sleeping language and it's just such a honour to play my small part in bringing some life for a moment. It'll come back to life. Malik's all the way from Egypt and um, me and Wakara are from Arnhem Land and Travis from South Australia and for all of us to learn Buddy Maya with Godfrey it was uh, such an amazing experience. I've, I've said to him several times throughout the whole process, you know, I've taught for over 20 years and I, I, I haven't had better students. It's all about the students. They say I'm a good teacher, but I disagree because to learn another language at a mature age is bloody hard. Undudara, where you are you? Where you are you? Where you are you? Where you are you? Where you are I mean, it's great and all that you can be given a script. When you look at the piece of paper, it, it becomes quite mechanical. You need to really spend time with people who speak the language. It's getting extinct. It's a, it's a very fragile language now because, and, and being able to bring it to screen and make people actually hear it again through through me as an actor is a big I felt a big responsibility the first 
time that we shot a dialogue scene um, in Buddy Meyer, whereby we had, you know, Hanif, an Afghan character, Janda, a Punjab Indian character, and Warak, who was a, a Buddy Meyer character, and uh, they're having this exchange, and it is entirely in the indigenous Buddy Meyer language. There was this realization that we were doing something that had never been done before. Um, Roderick came up and he introduced himself. Um, he's what is it, the crew he had with him, his wife. Um, and then they went away again, and after Roderick had come up, uh, after that initial introduction, um, we then got on to a working group, formed a working group with the Buddy Mark community, and we basically went through the story. Um, and throughout um, the, the working group, uh, that the first uh, working group meeting, it became aware because I had two uncles, an uncle and a cousin, who were fully initiated men, and they noticed that. The, there was a very sacred part of the story um, in, 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 within the script um, which had to be removed um, and much respect to Roderick um, for totally understanding and thank you very much Roderick you don't realize how much that means from my bottom of my heart and buddy my communities People's All right, so as Jackie has discussed, um, Barima is a sleeping language currently, and so this means for a translation project like this one, uh, we require a larger team of people involved than um, potentially would be required uh, for a translation projects um, for a more widely spoken language, for instance. And so that's um, how we've ended up with, with the team um, who are involved in the project. So this is principally um, involved Godfrey Simpson, um, who you've just heard from, a Wagadi Buddy Maya man, he's a fluent Wagadi speaker, uh, Buddy Maya on his mum's side, and he's um, done a huge amount of work, um, sort of linguistically and culturally, um, over the last few decades. Um, and he's got um, very close ties and networks within the Buddy Maya community. There's also myself as a linguist who's worked with the Buddy Maya community uh, for over a decade. Um, and with uh, substantial linguistic and structural grammatical knowledge of Badimaya. And then um, the Badimaya language focus group, who was made up of around uh, 15 Badimaya community members representing different families and different areas of Badimaya country. Um, again, with specialist um, cultural knowledge, language knowledge, um, and very importantly, um, sort of being language owners and um, authorities of that language, able to speak for that language um, and able to sort of guide this process. And so, um, as is becoming clear, I think, um, this is quite a, a complex um, process, this translation process involving multiple people. Um, and we can illustrate a little bit of the complexity um, of this uh, translation project here in this table, um, showing the different stages, um, some of the different stages that were involved. Um, and here, again, highlighting um, some of those key people um, and the interaction between these key people. So um, as we've just seen in the, past, uh, the prior slide, um, we've got sort of the, the key translator team um, involving particularly Godfrey and myself. Um, and that's also that um, very important body mail language focus group who um, were able to sort of oversee and direct um, the translation project. We also have um, the Bandia Irrawonga Language Centre um, who act as a kind of peak body for, for the region um, and for everything to do um, with um, sort of language and language projects in the region and particularly who are um, able to act as a sort of go-between between, between the community and external stakeholders. And um, also here we have the um, the filmmakers, so um, particularly the director and writer, Roderick. Um, and so, as we can see here, we've got this constant interchange at all of the all of the levels um, of um, you know, all of the stages of, of the translation process. So, to start with, we had this 
um, sort of initial script review um, right at the beginning, um, which again was really, really important um, so that um, from, from the start we knew um, whether this was actually going to be possible and achievable in terms of um, doing, that, doing that translation, but also that we could do it in a way that um, sort of respected and retained the integrity of, of Bainimaya throughout, um, as well as then being able to be a sort of a true representation and, and follow the vision of the, this, um, the script writers. At the beginning, um, Godfrey was a, a very um, integral um, person in, in overseeing that um, and being able to um, um, yeah, know sort of whether and then how we were going to be able to deliver um, that, what parts were going to be uh, potentially more difficult, require more consultation, and then discuss um, these various difficulties um, with um, the community. So then this led on to the, um, the sort of the core translation. Um, this really involved a constant dialogue and interchange between the filmmakers, um, between Godfrey and myself, and then between the community and particularly um, that um, language focus group um, to make sure that everybody was on the same page um, and that um, there was that sort of due process um, throughout. And this whole um, translation process obviously sort of hinged and was based upon um, an extensive collection of um, body Maya language information that had been collected and documented by the Language Centre, by um, Body Maya community, um, and particularly um, by a, an important um, Body Maya old man, Anthony Oli George, who passed away in 2018. Obviously, there are um, a lot of um, different difficulties that come with any translation project, but um, doing um, this translation project with, within the constraints of a sleeping language um, is a compounded um, somewhat. Um, a couple of things that might come up are things like um, not having a body Maya word or concept remembered or recorded um, for a portion of the, the, um, the, the script. Um, or you might have English dialogue which doesn't make sense when translated particularly literally into body Maya. Um, so again, some of these things will come up with any translation project but particularly with a, a sleeping language um, where we're kind of um, constrained in some ways with um, what knowledge has been captured, um, has been documented. Um, and so then we have to think about um, how we can work with that um, in order to, to deliver, um, in this case, what the filmmakers want in terms of the message. So a couple of examples, something like here we've got an example where it, involving um, the idea of missing. So, um, you know, you missed the kangaroo. Well, we don't have um, a word sort of recorded or remembered in Badimaya. And so it had to be sort of reimagined or retranslated um, in order to say you didn't hit the kangaroo. Or um, a slightly different um, um, example here where um, initially in the English dialogue, um, the filmmakers wanted to um, represent this idea of being sorry, but in Badi Maya, um, we would represent that more with um, this idea of sadness and um, sharing, sort of being empathetic through that, through that sadness. All right, so that gives you a little bit of a glimpse into, I guess, um, those, those stages of um, sort of initial sort of um, uh, reviewing of the scripts, some of the translation process that was involved and that interchange between the different um, teams, community, um, and um, yeah, and other people involved in that process. And then this led then to the, the I guess the final stage um, of, of this, um, this, this project, which involved the, the coaching of the actors um, in Buddy Maya. And that was undertaken again by Godfrey. Um, so I will pass over to Godfrey, who um, can now discuss a little bit more about about that process, about guiding the actors and um, teaching the actors body Maya. I said I'm going to treat you as preschoolers, but I'm not going to talk to you as if you were preschoolers. 
the, the teaching method is going to be from preschoolers, you, you know, from K to seven, or my K to three. So they were all. I said sort of, it's going to be like I'm teaching first, second, and third graders, but you know that's not the case. And they laughed, and they were all, you know, it was it was a good um, exchange um, in that regard. And the what did we have? Three Aboriginal actors, two. Muslim actors, and they were as good as each other. The first and second day, I was was I was, I was trying to get used to being on a movie set where I could and couldn't go. Um, I got told off maybe twice in the first day, standing in the wrong place, um, not scolded, just told off, um, and that was good. And then I. By the end of it, I was like I was a movie producer myself. I was out there on set to tell them to stop, and I'd run out and I I took over the show one part of it. <laughs> stop, cut! No, I didn't say that. But I, I mean, I was there right out, and you know, when when they were when makeup was out there doing other actors' makeup, I was there getting a few quick words and correcting the actors, and um, or they would look to me and then. Then someone would call cut, and then they, I'd either shout out over the top, you know, the word I'd run out on the set, and we'd go maybe spend it. It, it only lasted 60 seconds, some of the, you know, touch ups, the language touch ups. When we went out and started shooting in the main camp, then that's when we had all, all the locals from Magnet come out. Yeah, it was good. Um, hi everyone, so my name is Rosie Satoris, I'm the coordinator at the Bandiera Etawonga Language Centre and I'm going to talk about some of the fundamental stuff. <laughs> we are a not-for-profit organisation which is quite similar to the um, organisational status that is available um, around the world um, and we run a fee-for-service program um, for anyone who wants to engage our services or the services of our language communities. So the first part of the process for me um, after meeting with Roderick, the director, and talking with him about whether it was possible at all um, was outlining a potential budget um, which was sent through to Roderick and his producers um, and they then came back to us and negotiated um, you know, what they were actually able to afford. It was a true negotiation and one that was it was definitely equal um, between the filmmakers and the language centre um, which is you know a much better process than if it were to be between the filmmakers um, and, and individual community members so we sort of present a collective um, that can advocate for and with those communities. Um, logistically it was a huge undertaking. Um, we had a couple of different introductory sessions where we met with the community and talked with them about um, you know the fact that the film was being made and what they thought of it, um, visited Mount Magnet, visited Perth and then also brought people to Geraldton. Um, we coordinated with James Bernal on Skype, we brought in people from all over the state, um, you know, helping them with getting fuel and accommodation and, um, and ensuring that they were able to participate in a way that felt comfortable and meaningful to them. Um, we had to make sure that the meeting space worked and was a friendly and welcoming place for people. And we had to make sure that people were well fed. It's the most important thing when you're consulting with any community, um, be it, you know, language community or academics. <laughs> Um, and of course, we had to make sure that those people had all their paperwork ready to go in order to be paid for that consultation. Um, so just for one day of consultation, you know, when it came down to that sort of pointy end of things, um, it was a huge logistical exercise and one that's really difficult um, for a community organisation, let alone individual community members trying to work separately. So I'm just going to hammer that home that that collective is really important. One of the other things that we worked on was a copyright licensing agreement. Um, and so once the material was ready to, to be provided to the filmmakers, we sought advice from Arts Law, who are a community legal centre in Australia, and we got advice from them on how to ensure, ensure that the information was used correctly and fairly by the filmmakers and that we weren't going to contravene any of their copyrights. 
Um, now, this is good practice. I think it should be sort of minimum practice for all community organisations, particularly language organisations. Um, but even if you're friendly with and trust outsiders, if we're going to call people that, um, it is important to set down those parameters of the relationship um, and the use of the materials because those materials are going to exist forever and um, your organisational memory might not last beyond five, 10 years. The last thing was that we worked on the wording for an acknowledgement of Gamioli in the credits of the film. I think it's sometimes an understated part of language work um, and sort of linguistic work, you know, right up into academia that these things, that recognition and acknowledgement is more than just a symbolic gesture. It's something that recognises that without those people, these processes are impossible. Uh, so, a corporation that enters into an agreement enters with the continuity power and organisational memory um, that an individual doesn't have. Um, and as the Language Centre for this region, we wanted to make sure that we were able to enter into that agreement, enforce the agreement um, and negotiate it on behalf of the community in a way that benefited them best. Um, we had this great conversation with the lawyer at Arts Law about how we could sort of provide for all these possible future iterations of the work. So talking about things like film trailers or educational materials or you know, the stories, anything that you can sort of imagine as being a possibility of, um, you know, this work being manifested in another way, we tried to plan for it. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do in this consultation was ensure that the community had the opportunity to say no. So the actual content of the film itself um, was in some instances quite sensitive and the filmmakers in fact worked with some of the community um, to change and remove some parts that were too sensitive for public broadcast um, and it's something that we really respected from the filmmakers and that we always apply as best practice and that is making sure that when someone says no we hear it um, and we honour that, that answer. Uh, this process really taught us that in a situation <clears throat> of a sleeping language, the authority and the knowledge of a language are vested in different places. So in Buddy Meyer, James and Godfrey both have a lot of knowledge to work with the language. Um, they both worked with Gamioli quite extensively, um, but both also need some other outside authority to help um, ensure that they are doing the right thing um, culturally. They need to have those checks in place. Um, obviously, Godfrey less than James. The final part of that model that we talk about is this sort of general social consideration of whether this project is actually a benefit for the community. How can we maximise the benefit for the community as well? And what do those benefits look like? Are they financial? Are they social, um, cultural? You know, and these are considerations for us as, as the regional language centre. But it is also my belief that these need to be considerations for individuals, academics, anybody working with communities on this kind of um, cultural project work that needs to be a consideration. So projects like this uh, film translation help us be passive language advocates. We all know that seeing yourself represented on screen is an important part of being accepted as part of the mainstream um, and it lends that prestige and um, I guess um, recognition of a language and knowledge system that a lot of people in Australia are probably not aware of. If you're seeing language used in film and the community is seeing it being used in, you know, things promoting the film on social media, in, you know, traditional media, um, it normalises that language as an important and integral part of life. Um, and that goes outside the model of what sometimes people talk about as the revitalisation um, or the realm of revitalisation in that it's not focusing on, you know, sort of transmission between um, community members. It's more of a broadcast of the language to outsiders. Um, but we did note anecdotally that this film and this project had a great impact on the community's sense of um, linguistic identity and sense of importance and prestige of their own language. Um, there's been a lot of sharing of the film on social media. So that's really lovely to see. Um, this model 
at its heart is collaborative. And so the Language Centre, the filmmakers um, and the community were able to work productively and sustainably for something um, so important. Um, and it also shows that it's possible for a sleeping language to be used in, an, in this way. Um, it just takes a little bit longer and just needs a little bit more attention, but it is certainly possible. It also shows that language work isn't just dictionaries and recordings, which is often um, the anecdote we get from people, oh, you just make books and you just make posters. Um, but it shows that languages are thriving and integral part of cultural life. And it is in every part of everyone's life. And if that can contribute to the linguistic vitality um, in this region, in the country, then we will have done our job. I, I, I've got a good feeling because I think the language on this movie is going to be... No disrespect to any other Australian languages that have been put in, uh, in Australian movies, but... I don't know, I think it's just the, the actors and themselves, I think they did a good job. They spoke like true buddy my men and and Gamioli would be proud. He would be so proud to hear these young strangers talk in his language. I'm all about showcasing my language and culture, but to have it have it um, given to the world in such a format, I think is awesome. Thank you. Uh, that is all from us. So, Yuranala, thank you for listening. And I hope you learned a little bit about this process and about body my language um, and the wonderful people who strive to keep it going and to keep it on our screens.